Con is tea, how are ye? We're Candlelit Tales and welcome to the Candlelit Tales podcast. I'm Sarah Gaggerty and I'm here with my brother. And I'm Aaron and I'm sitting down with my sister in the Shafis recording the podcast. We are the founders of Candlelit Tales. We started Candlelit Tales about four years ago. We do Irish stories, we set them to music, we're constantly looking for new ways to tell these old tales. And when we started these shows, we did this on a donations basis. So people who could pay, paid what they could so that we could keep it going for everybody. And that's what we want to do for this podcast as well. So if you like what we're doing and you want to support us, you can go to patreon.com forward slash candlelit tales and throw us a few quid if you if you like. You know, be sound. Yeah, like, you know. Um, we had loads going on this month. It was a little bit hectic. So we're going to relax and unwind with three short stories. All right, Aaron, over to you for the first one. All righty. The Birth of Lou Cian of the Tuatha Dé was the great and famous cowherd for he owned the glass gowan, the cow that would always give milk. Even in the harshest of winters, Cian would never go for the want of milk, and he would always have something to drink and something to eat if he wanted to just make some hard, soft or chewy milk, depending on the weather. Cian was famous for having this cow, and so he always guarded it safely. He held her on a rope, always within arm's reach of her. Whenever they went out, he guarded her specially. But one day he went off with his brother to visit Gubnu the smith to make two great swords. As they were going over the hills, his brother went on ahead of him to visit Gubnu, so Cian would remain at the bottom of the hill, minding his cow. They were there a while, and after some time, A little red-haired boy with one gleaming eye and a patch over the other came up to Cian and said he had overheard Gubnu laughing, saying he had only enough metal to work one sword that day and not enough to make one for Cian. Now Cian was outraged by this and he asked the young boy to mind the glass gown and call out if anyone approached them. The boy with red hair and one eye smiled up at him and said he would. Cian ran up the hill and saw Gubnu working, and not one, but two swords. He realised instantly he had been tricked. Now Cian wondered who that red-haired, one-eyed boy really was. For it could have been anyone that shape shifted themselves into that form to steal away his cow. He knew this because this was the time of magic. So Cian went to be rogue of the mountain to ask her for her advice. She welcomed him in and in the pool she saw who this red-haired and one-eyed boy really was. She knew that this was Balor of the Evil Eye. Now Cian fell backwards, shocked to hear this. The one man, the king of the Fomorians, the greatest tribe up in Northern Ireland from Tory Island, had dominion over the seven kingdoms of the Fuimira, the people that belonged to the sea and had dominion over it. They pillaged and plundered and raided Ireland's shore for countless years, and Balor was known to be their fiercest and most fearless of leaders. Cian felt hopeless. Birog told Cian, Balor could not be killed by anyone other than his grandson. This prophecy had been known since the birth of Balor's only child, Ethlin. His daughter was locked away in the northernmost tip of Tory Island in a glass tower surrounded by 50 women and none of them would allow a single man into that keep, and no man was allowed near the northern tip of Tory Island. So Ethelin would never ever meet a single man, and so would never have a child that could grow to kill Balor. Cian looked at Birog, who was smiling at him in a certain sort of a way. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? he said. 
and she smiled, knowing that it was really her that had given him the idea. She told him not to do anything other than what she specifically told him. Kian agreed to this, and she instantly told him to put on a dress. She gave him the likeness and look of a great fair woman, and she called up a great storm then. Wind and rain lashed against their faces as she called up a wind to carry them over the sea and land them on the wind-buffeted, stormy coast of Tory Island. There they saw the great glass tower. They ran to it and knocked on it, pleading for entry. Fifty handmaidens came to the door and told them they would never normally let anyone in, but seeing as they were women in need, they would let them come in this night. The two women entered. Birog announced she would sing them a song out of gratitude. She sang them a sleeping song, and every one of the women, bar Kian, fell asleep. Birog turned to Kian and told him to climb up the stairs and he would meet Ethelin. He walked the stairs all the way around and around and around till he came to the very top. He knocked the door now, not sure what he would actually say to the woman inside after all. How are you? I'm here to meet you in order to make a revenge baby. Didn't sound like very much of a good opening line, but as the door swung open, he saw a beautiful woman inside. And she saw him, and when their eyes locked, she exclaimed one line, one word. You. And she explained to him that she recognised him from a dream. The same dream she'd been getting for most of her life. She had dreamt of a man's face, with green eyes, strong chin, and a friendly smile. And Kian smiled his friendly smile with his green eyes staring back. He did not know why she'd been dreaming of him, but they fell into an embrace that was full of love. In the morning, Kian turned himself into a great swan and jumped out the window, knowing he could not stay where he was, in the arms of Ethelin, for Balor would soon find out. He would not get the glass going back, but he knew Ethelin would become pregnant, and the child she bore, he would one day grow up to kill Balor and avenge Kian for stealing his Glasgowan. Months passed, and Birog kept a close eye on the coast, waiting and watching, till she heard the cry from Methlin's tower, and Balor's booming voice that called up a whirlwind. There was not one, not two, but three children born, Ethlin and Kian. But Balor took them in his hands and threw them down into a whirlpool. They would drown down there only for Birog, cast a magic spell, turning two of them into the first Selkies. And one she caught with a wave and carried it to Arden's shore. And when it came to her hands, she gave the child to Kian and told him to name him Lou. It was before the Second Battle of Moitura. The Tua de Danon were squaring off against the Formorians, the Fuivuera, for the final time, and it was going to be the deciding battle, to see who would rule Ireland forevermore. And so the Dagdamore decided that they needed all the help that they could get, the Tua de. Particularly, they needed the help of the Morrigan, goddess of war. And so he went to find her, to ask her if she'd be on their side, encourage their troops, maybe take the form of her battle crow and fly over the enemy, striking terror into their hearts. Better yet, rain some blood down on top of them. 
or even fire if she had a mind to rain the fire. The Dagda took a good look at the angles, considered it all from every side, and he thought, you know what, I think I can do this. And so he went upstream of where the Morrigan was, and he climbed into the river. He got himself going, and he got himself floating. And as he floated down between the legs of the Morrigan, well, he stopped. Because they just slotted right together. And once he was docked, the Dagda did so well, the Morrigan was so pleased with the loving he gave her that she said that she would be on his side in that battle. She took her form of battle crow, she rained down fire, she rained down blood, she struck fear into the hearts of their enemies. And some time later, the Morrigan realised that she was with child, the Dagda's child. And she gave birth to a daughter on the first day of February, just as the sun was rising, a little girl. And the second that girl was born was the second that the sun rose and a flame shot up from her head and joined the beams of light from the rising sun and the child and the sun rose up into the sky together, blazing the first sign of a new spring to come. The Morrigan named the girl Bridget, but she was not a very maternal goddess and so she took her to the other world and let her be suckled by another world cow. And when that girl came back to this world, well, everywhere she stepped, flowers sprung up in her footprints. She was the goddess of honey and bees. She was the goddess of brewing and mead. She was the goddess of craft and wisdom. And she was the goddess of the fire of poetic inspiration. She was Bridget, healer, teacher, protector, guardian of the sacred flame. The birth of Satanta. Dectra was a beautiful woman of Ulster. She was the chariot driver of the king of Ulster, the king, her brother, Crahor MacNassa, Crahor, son of Nasa. Ni Esa was her name, the not gentle one, the one who had lost her gentleness by killing all the men who had killed her family. Dectra and Crohor had been brought up by this not very gentle woman. She had won the kingship for her son Crohor, and Dectra had watched as she guided through cunning and wiseness the steering of the kingdom around with Crohor MacNassa. And Dectra learned these cunning ways from her mother, but she was fearless, just like her as well. And she drove the king's chariot first and fearlessly into every fight. Now as she grew into a beautiful woman, the whisperings of marriage went all around the court in Awan Maka, and people wondered who could take her hand in marriage. But Crahur knew that somebody special would have to marry his sister and a great alliance should be set up for it. Suitor after suitor was refused by his very picky sister Dectra, not really wanting to engage with this whole marriage and happy ever after type of idea, but once suited him a MacRoy, a great land owner in Dundalgan, to the east and south of Ulster back then, he came and offered a great lot of land and friendship to the king, well... Dectra liked the look of him. He was nice and soft and kind at heart and so she agreed to the marriage and Crahor was happy with this. Celebrations were sent out, the Crave Rua amassed in Awan Maka. A great celebration was to be had on the eve of the wedding. Everyone was in great form. Dectra was in her room and her chambers with fifty handmaids all around. They were donning her with beautiful garments and 
moisturising her skin and telling her she was really doing the right thing in marrying Suleiman McRoy, but even after 50 voices had told her she still had a feeling in the pit of her stomach that what she was doing was in earnest. And through the window she saw a shaft of light strike off the floor and there where not seen before she saw a man, a great gleaming strong bold man staring down at her with a shock of blonde hair and a stare that stilled her heart. This man had a crimson cloak wrapped around his shoulders in the seven fold with gold clasped at the chest. He offered her his hand and said, come away with me to the other land. She knew at once that this must be Lou, love, father, Lou of the two a day Danon from the other world to go beyond the veil now on the eve of her marriage. Well, it didn't take her very long to leap into his arms and be taken away to the other world. We don't know what happened to Dectra. But all we do know is that Krohor Magnassa and Suldan McRoy and the rest of the Crave Rua in Awan Maka were very confused to find an empty chamber where there had been fifty handmaidens and Dectra there the night before. There was not a track or trace of them left behind. Krohor, of course, was worried for his sister and sent out messages and looked all over Ireland for her. After time went by, slowly Crohor Magnassa began to realise he may not see his sister ever again. But after a year and a day of this dismay, Crohor looked out his window in Omaka and he saw 50 birds flying across the sky. These birds were chained in silver at the feet and Kaffa the Druid announced that these were birds from the other world and it was a sign that they must go in chase. Krohor gathered up the Crave Rua and led them out the gates of Owen Maka. Over the hills and valleys they were led by this flock of birds all over Ireland till they came down to the south, the southern lands of Munster. And in a barren place they lost track of the birds in the sky. And over the hill they saw a plume of smoke. No other lodgings had been seen, but the men thought they could find a way to put their heads down that night, if the lodging would hold them. Bikru of the bitter tongue persuaded the king to let him be the one to go and knock on the door and ask for lodging that night. Bikru walked off and he knocked on a small cottage but a man came to the door that seemed he could not fit in it. Great shining hair and a stare that seemed to stop his heart and a woman there he faintly recognised. Now Bikru realised that this was Dectra, this was a man from the other world and he went running back to King Grohor. But Bikru of the bitter tongue liked to stir mischief whenever he could and a bitter word was better than one in kind. And so he reminded the king that the man who would lodge them that night had a beautiful wife and it was only right that the king should sleep with the wife of the man of the house as was custom of the time. The king nodded and Fergus McRoy too agreed although they didn't understand the mischief in Bikru's eyes. They decided not to listen to Bikru too much, but carried on and when they came to where Bikru had led them they saw not a small lodging but a great and brilliant feasting hall and the smell of food wafted around and meat their noses and lead them through the doors and drink and eat in merriment then as the great shining man sat at the top of the table encouraging the men to eat their fill and drink even more but he apologized for his wife not being there for she was in the throes of labor in the next room the men did not take much notice but looked around to think they might recognize some of the 50 women that were serving them food and drink but then a sleep came over them and their eyelids came heavy and they drifted off into a deep dark slumber. 
Krahor awoke, and there lying next to him was Dectra, his sister, with a bundle in her arms. He knew at once that the man must have been from the other world. The house had vanished as with all of the food. But fifty handmaidens, now he recognised as Dectra's women, were all around the men. And they now all knew that Lou of the other world had had a child with Dectra, the woman of Ulster, the king's sister, the charioteer driver, and this child would be a legend everyone knew, and so every one of the Crave Rua offered to be the foster father for this child, to bring him up in the right way. Blay, the distributor, offered to give him his learning. Amergan, the poet, offered his teaching of kind and Fergus McCroy, the great warrior, decided to bring him up in the ways of the warrior. And Kaffa announced that every one of the Crave Rua, the legends and heroes, the wise men and the learned men would have a hand in equal part and measure to raise this child up and so he would never be wanting for learning or any form of learning. Dectra named him Satanta, and she brought him back to Dundalgin, where Suladim MacRoy was happy to have her back in his arms and take her as his wife. She raised Satanta up in Dundalgin, and he grew very fast and very keen and very clever, and Dectra could not have known the tragic life that laid out for her son Satanta after he would take the name Colin. Ku Colin is my favorite. <laughs> of course he is. Ku Colin has always been my favorite. <laughs> Ku Colin was the first of the stories that I told you yeah. because I came across a fictionalized version of it. Uh, by an author called Morgan Llewellyn, whose surname I'm definitely mispronouncing, called On Raven's Wing. Yeah. When I was in my teens, and it was, I just, I started like reading that book over and over again and telling you that story whenever you were annoying me. And m- m- our mother um, didn't let you read the, the, the sex bit. Did I try um, and read it to you? You did, yeah. I, that, um, was, that was not age appropriate. I was not age appropriate. I was quite small. Um, <laughs> well, like you were six years younger than me. So when I was like 14, you were like, yeah, you know, you were too young for that. Um, I, I remember getting the book and going, huh? And I was like, no, don't read that, don't read that. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But um, yeah, that's a shout out to Anna who uh, requested the a birth story of Colin. So that was for you. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, we are getting to the stories. Uh, we're also playing with that the people have requested I mean and uh, we're also playing with uh, I don't know how we how we style these podcasts yeah we're playing around with the format a little bit so let us know what you what you thought of that one that was kind of the three shorter stories rather than the one longer story and we've done stories of varying different lengths because I don't know uh, my preference is for a you know telling the story in as much detail as it needs And then having the chat afterwards and letting it go where it goes. But if your preference is for like, I know this podcast is going to take X amount of time to listen to, please tell us that. (laughs) Because left to our own devices, we'll probably just keep on doing this. Well, there's also something about, I I love the short snippets. And I guess, you know, it's spring. uh, We've just had Equinox, you know, we're we're moving on to the next Celtic uh, festival. We're in this kind of time of fertility and growth and that's the time for birth stories and that's why we said well there is we can't just land on one there's so many very important characters to cover absolutely and like we tend to group today we tend to group the stories by kind of cycle Hmm. but actually a lot of the time you know in in Celtic heritage um, by Reese and Reese they they talk a lot about how the stories tended to be grouped by theme you had your birth stories, you had your death stories, you had your voyage stories. And there was a kind of a sense of like, you know, th- it wasn't so much the, the whole saga beginning to end. It was like the bits. 
that yeah. were appropriate for this time. But Which if, I always think is kind of cool. It, it is. I, I think that's that's our way, certainly my way of, of relearning and restructuring the, the mythology in my head. I had to kind of go, OK, hang on. There's the Phoenix cycle. That's mm-hmm. one. There's the mythological cycle that came before it. That's that's two. There's the Ulster cycle with Cullen. And then there's the King cycle and, and all those stories. And you're like, OK, there's four cycles. Now we can just kind of hone in on, on them. But I guess when they were more widely known then you can mix and match a little bit easier without confusing audiences and stuff they're pretty mixed and matched I mean you've got the story there of Lou uh, Lou's birth and then the story of Cucullin's birth which features Lou so like none of them are in and you know the Fianna go to the other world and meet the two of did and all the time the crossover is unreal the kings go into the mythological stuff all the time so like there's all of the different um yeah, there's all these different cycles, and there's there's the, the the you know the invasions as part of the mythological cycle as well, the different peoples coming to Ireland, which we've talked up, talked about in a previous we podcast. Have. I mean, just did a show about with uh, with a group from Treprovision as well in um, this land, which is great. I went down a treat, yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, check out our website for details of that, and it might come back. Oh yeah, there you oh, go. Yeah, there you you go. never know. You never know. Trying to bring it back. So you were saying about uh, solstices and equinoxes and things, and this is kind of like we talked about this and in, in how to structure this podcast to try and keep it some way in line with what's going on in the natural world in Ireland. Yeah, because that's an interest of mine, and it's something that I don't know a massive amount about. So I always kind of, when I'm curious about something and don't know a lot about it, I always start doing it and see what happens. That's what happened to me in mythology. Yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look what happened there. <laughs> <laughs> look where that leads you. <laughs> dangerous places, children, dangerous places. So like, yeah, this is kind of, it's something that I'm I'm starting to learn about, this Celtic calendar that's divided in four. And it used to totally mess with me. Yeah, it, it, me- it yeah me too. Because I think of it as being solstice and equinox as the four kind of points of the year like we're in the northern hemisphere here and the you know the summer solstice is the longest day winter solstice is the longest night and then you've two equinoxes where you've got like equal light and dark um we're just past the spring one as you said but the celtic festivals the big celtic festivals didn't happen on those dates and it took me a long time to figure out what the hell was going on They happen on the midpoint between them. Mm -hmm. So you've got your, you know, you've got your solstice celebration, maybe, sure. But the main one is Imbolg. That is like the the traditional beginning of spring, like break of the winter on the 1st of February. They're also, by the way, super easy to remember because they're the first of the month. Yeah. Which makes it really easy. And then you've got the... um, May. The one we're coming up to is Bealtaine. Yeah. Which is the first of May, and that's your May Day celebration, which is still like a thing. Huge. It's a, it's still a huge thing. First day of summer, and I always think, sorry, carry on. Uh, the next one is for is the first of. Uh, well, hang on, we've got. <laughs> where are we? Uh, May summer equinox. Uh, uh-huh. Lunasa. First of yeah, Lunasa is the start of autumn. We're always kind of like the the traditional Irish calendar is like kind of a month behind the official start of everything which I kind of think is cool because we're looking for you know the subtle beginnings of things like August is the is it it, it kind of feels like end of summer but really that's the start of autumn that's when your harvest starts coming in you know it's all food related it's so mad like as in like even though people say oh there's no way spring starts the 1st of February and apparently some people some scientists said recently oh no it starts in March we're like well things begin to grow things exactly. literally open up and look around and go oh I'm not going to die if I poke my head out of the ground right now and then maybe you will because we frequently get snow in February I mean but, like, but no it's frequently but. It's, it's, the, it's the beginning of the stirring of life yeah and that's yeah. why that's what I mean by like it's a little bit more subtle that like yeah. it's not oh yeah spring is here and everything is in bloom it's like spring is here and everything is starting to wake up yeah it's yeah, going to yeah. take a month before it's like woken up and the same thing with like the start of summer is like you know the first of May is like yeah it's the start of summer yeah. High summer is going to be at the at the equinox, and then you know it all kind of makes sense when you map it out that way. And then, of course, the most important one. Well, Samhain, of course, which we'll you know celebrate in its own time as well is Samhain, which got exported to America, became Halloween, 
got really, really fun and then came back again to us and we were like, yeah, cool, we'll dress up. This is a great crack. And we used to hollow turnips and then we got, we came to America, or we, I say we, the lads, you know, the descendants, and they went to America and realised there was pumpkins. They were Man, like, this is so much easier. Those new world gourds. <laughs> <laughs> they, really, they really hold a pump, pumpkin lantern. <laughs> and they came back to the lads, stop with the turnips, we've got pumpkins now, it's all grand. Did you make a turnip lantern one year? Or did I you tried to. It? It's yeah, it's so impossible. Turnips are really <laughs> hard to so carve. Hard. They're really hard to like, chop. I ended up like trying to calf cook it, then I ended up cooking it, and then I just ate it. So <laughs> <laughs> it's just a lot easier to. I mean, that sounds about right. <laughs> um, but yeah, like they they also if you if you look them up on a Google image search, aren't the freakiest looking fucking things. So but we'll get back to them when it's actually seven. So can we will of course. So Bridget, we had a whole episode on uh, in at the start of February as well, and her birth story. I love the dog and the Morgan. They're just such great characters. Oh, they're great characters. Um, I I like I love that the Dagda is this. He's such a character, like he's this god of hospitality and he's good at everything and he's highly skilled and he's highly intelligent and he buffoon. comes across like such a fucking buffoon. Like such a, like, you know, goes around in a tunic that doesn't fit him with his belly hanging out the front and his arse hanging out the back. He's scaldy, like, he's just scaldy. <laughs> he's a scaldy fecker, like, you know. He's he so, is. he is so very, very scaldy. And then out of that union between the goddess of war and himself becomes the goddess of fertility and but abundance it, and it craft makes so much sense of all of Bridget's different aspects as like war goddess and yeah. healing goddess and like woman who will turn you into stone if you don't share your salt with her like you know she's got the the generosity the gregariousness the hospitality coming from her dad's side and she's got the like fucking you know come on if you think you're hard enough war goddess full on battle crow coming from her mom's side absolutely and she's you know able to to make something of that by the way we don't know that that's actually her conception story we know that Bridget the goddess is the daughter of the Dagda and the Morrigan and the only story that I've found so far of the two of them getting it on is that story poetic license but like well we're joining a dot here we're joining we're, a dot we're, we're drawing a line you we know? do we do that a fair bit in Cattle Tales we join dots yeah Often, we we know, you know they we know they had the ride and we know they had a daughter so like <laughs> let's just put those two stories together. And anyway, uh, another two of the Dan um, are Fear Day, as I try and refer to them now. Um, the godlike people, Lou, you know his his day is you know his name has been given to places all over Ireland. He's so yep. prominent and Lunasa. So loud. So loud, you know, um, and and yet like you have this amazing. A uh, union between a woman who gets completely forgotten about and not written about, and you know this the owner of a magic cow, which in those days was I presume very important. But oh yeah, I mean, if you think back to um, Ireland before we got to potatoes, this is not a country where wheat grows particularly well. Wheat was kind of an aristocracy food. You have a lot of oats, you have some veg, and your main protein source is is going to come from dairy, which is why you know. A lot of people around the world are lactose intolerant unless they're from a culture like ours that has been cultivating cattle for a long, 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 long time. You know, there was a medieval manuscript that talked about all of the food that you ate in kind of the spring months. Oh, I love like this. Like before the harvest, before the before the kind of summer berries are out and like, you know, before the, when you're running low on harvest stores, you live off milk and you have thick milk and you have thin milk and you have chewy milk. Oh, which I just Aww. like. I love that they didn't name it a different name. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's not cheese. It's chewy milk. Chewy milk. <laughs> like, which is, is, is actually what it is, you know. Yeah, like milk at various different stages of being cultured into other foods. That's what you, that's what you ate. And out of that union between, you know, again, the, the four Moorings we talked about before about the people from the from Tory Island and Balor's daughter and, you know... Uh, this these kind of grotesque orc like people well um, I think that's something to talk about as well because it, it, it really shines a light on the fact that the Fomorians are not evil absolutely like, you know we've talked about this as well in I think in, in Irish mytholo- mythology there isn't like a clear good guys bad guys no. divide and a lot of modern retellings that play off Irish mythology or mention Fomorians do make them orcs 
and make them these grotesque creatures that come from under the sea and are fully, fully evil. That's not what it is in the mythology. And like Ethelin's a good example of that, that she's, you know, there are se- also there are seven kings of the Fomorians and what, like two of them join Bress in his war against Ireland? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A bunch of them don't. Yeah. Including Bress's dad. By the way, we'll get onto that whole thing in a bit more detail yeah, another at time. a later date. But I just realised I was referring to a story that we hadn't actually yeah, done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's okay, we'll get there. But okay, so land on Lou, and Lou becomes the shining one, the, like, you know, he, supposedly he's still represented in the Celtic crosses because the, the sun idea that it was so important the, yeah. the, the that circle that circle well the circle is the circle of the year as well yeah, yeah, it's the yeah. circle of the sun and the circle of the year it's the circle of the solar calendar because so, you know you've got the two calendars extant in the world you've got the solar calendar which is the one we've just talked about and you've got the lunar calendar which is like the, say the Chinese calendar is mm. a lunar one um, and it's one of those, you know, slight inconveniences of living on this planet that they don't line up. I'm sure there's other planets where they do. Um, they don't have good stories, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, there's less complicated mythology. Yeah. Um, but like, I, th- I always think it's really interesting that we have these two kind of different rhythms going on. Totally. Um, the water and the light, it's kind of... Yeah, the light and the dark, and they're, and they're, not, they're not quite in sync. They're mm-hmm. always just a little bit out of step, which is just, I don't know, I like that. Yeah, totally. Um, but yeah, the the Fomorians and the two of the Danon and like the union between the two of them being like this shining, wonderful paragon of a character. And then, of course, you know, we were just talking about how messy the, the cycles get. You know, you've got your four cycles, but there's so much crossover. And he steps in and out of them. And, and again, he's not exactly all good. He's He can be pretty bad in other times and the Sons of Tyrion is a great example of that where Which he will we'll we'll get to uh, but um, I guess what I love about Lou is the fact that he yeah of course he, he fathers Coo Cullen and becomes you know the lover of Dectra for a year and a day however length of time that is because no my, one knows my favourite character in that story is definitely Dectra oh yeah like I just love this idea of a woman on the eve of an arranged marriage being like do you know what extended hen party in the other world I'm going on an adventure and like we all know a year and a day couldn't be any length of time in the other world yeah That's we don't know like. what she got up to there is a nice big gap there like where Dectra is getting up to all, all sorts. sorts King's Charioteer that lady can handle herself and she's there with her 50 handmaidens you know her 50 best mates there's always 50 handmaidens always 50 handmaidens it Very seems handmaid. like a lot to me it's like as an entourage it's a bit unmanageable I mean, but th- it, that seems to be the way they rolled. Pretty badass. It's pretty. It's pretty badass. It's pretty badass. And yeah. of course, he do, you know he grows up Cúchulainn to be the great, the the one name of mythology that everyone in Ireland recognises before anybody else. And he came from the shining one, Lou La Fada, and the mother Dectra, the charioteer of the King of Ulster. Yeah. And like, of course, he's going to be badass and brilliant and beautiful and fantastic and heartbreaking and have oh, seven yeah. colours in his eyes. And, and seven fingers. And <sighs> the seven fingers is weird. Yeah. So one of them is seven pupils in his eyes, which sounds a bit spidery to me. That sounds he a bit was, gross. He was just a bit off. Yeah. Something but like, back. You'll remember a, him if you saw him. In a hot way, apparently. <laughs> I don't know. I don't get it. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, these these were three birth stories brought to you by myself and my sister as it's spring and we're just talking about births and all that. Yeah. And uh, did we mention we're playing around with the format a little bit. Yeah. So let us know what you think. Yeah. We're, yeah. Let us know. Do you like the longer stories? Do you like the shorter stories? Do we talk too much afterwards? You know. We definitely or, talk too much afterwards. Or not enough. I mean... <laughs> Maybe we don't talk tell enough us to, Tell us to shut up. <laughs> or not. <laughs> <laughs> you.